In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, if you could go, and up, go ahead and open up to the book of Psalms. Uh, we'll be continuing our series entitled Psalms for the Summer this morning, and the passage that we'll be looking at together is Psalm 126. So again, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Psalm 126. Otherwise, the, verse, uh, the passage will also be projected overhead. And if I could kindly ask everyone to please rise for the reading of God's word as an act of worship and as an act of reverence before him. And I'll read this for us. Psalm 126. This is the word of the Lord. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. This is the reading of God's word. Please be seated at this time. You know, this passage that we just read here together is one that can really relate to all of us in this room on a very deep level because it's a passage all about the human experience of sorrow and the human experience of tears. And according to one psychology article, scientists for centuries have studied this phenomenon of human tears, uh, trying to answer the question, why do we cry? And what they discovered is that although every animal, almost every creature and mammal on the earth, on the planet, it possesses tear glands and they're physically actually capable of shedding tears, what scientists have discovered is that human beings are actually the only creatures that shed tears for emotional reasons. You know, that the experience of crying, this experience of weeping, is exclusive only to human beings. And from just a purely biological standpoint and perspective, scientists are still not completely sure 100% you know, why that is. You know, science still can't pinpoint exactly the reason, physiologically at least, that you, we as human beings cry, why we shed tears. Now, from a philosophical angle, the French Enlightenment thinker uh, Voltaire, he's once been quoted by saying, tears are the silent language of grief. In other words, tears, the reason that we cry is because tears are this universal language that we all know that we use to express in those moments when we're feeling sadness and when we're feeling loss and heartbreak. And on an experiential level, I think many of us can resonate with that statement because in those moments in life, whether it's just a sad movie or you're experiencing some form of heartbreak or loss, in those moments, it's actually a lot harder to actually come up with words to say and in those moments, it's much easier just to let the tears start falling down your face. That's the way we communicate. Because in some way, and in some deep level, tears are this language that we instinctively know and use to express our sorrow and to express our grief when we're sad, according to Voltaire. Now, when it comes to the Bible, the scripture doesn't exactly necessarily explain to us completely why it is that we, we as human beings cry, you know, why we shed tears when we're feeling emotional or sad. But the thing that scripture does explain to us is how to cry and what exactly to do with our tears. And this passage that we just read, Psalm 20, 126, this psalm is a psalm all about grief and all about tears. But more specifically, it's a psalm that addresses and answers the question, how do we as God's people, how do we, re we respond to our tears? You know, what do we do with our tears? Whether you're an emotional person or not, whether you're a crier or not, you know, when you're hit with sadness and you're faced with suffering, what are you supposed to do with your tears? How do you respond? And so as we look at this passage together, Psalm 126 will show us two ways in which we as Christians, as believers, are supposed to respond when we're hit with sadness and when we're facing tears. And those two responses are first, to remember God's faithfulness, and secondly, to reap joy through sowing our tears. So again, our first response that we're called to in this psalm is first to remember God's faithfulness, to look back. But then our second response that Psalm 126 shows us is that we're also called to reap joy through sowing our tears. And so let's get right into this and begin with the first point, remembering God's faithfulness. You know, most commentators and most biblical scholars will categorize this psalm, Psalm 126, as a psalm of lament. Because in this psalm, Israel is going through some experience and some difficulty or trial that's causing them to despair and causing them to cry out to God for restoration. Before they actually cry out to God for any help, the very first thing that they do in this passage is they look to the past. 
You know, before they make any petition, petitions to God, before they even ask him anything, the very first thing they do is they turn to the past. They remember God's faithfulness to them before. Now, before we actually begin to look at this, I want to just provide a little bit of background for what it is the Israelites in this passage are actually remembering and looking back on. And if you look with me at verse 1, the psalmist opens this psalm by saying, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Now, what this is referring to is when God restored the Israelites from their exile in Babylon. And if you remember in the Old Testament, God, because of his faithfulness to Israel, because of his promise, he brought and led the Israelites into the promised land, into the land of Canaan. But because of all their sin, because of all the rebellion, because they continued to chase after false gods and false idols, they ignored all the warnings of God's prophets, God spit them out of the land. God, because of their, their sin and rebellion, he exiled them out of the land, and he allowed them to fall into captivity under the nation of Babylon. And so they were kicked out of the land, they lost their land, they lost their possessions, and they couldn't worship God in the temple anymore. But after 70 years of captivity, of exile, and 70 years of oppression, God, out of his grace and out of his mercy, he restored the Israelites, and he allowed them to return to the promised land. As verse 1 says, the Lord restored their fortunes. Now, what exactly does this mean here in verse 1? See, when verse 1 talks about restoring fortunes, it's not necessarily just talking about this material sort of physical prosperity, although that's definitely a part of it. But really, at the heart of God's restoration of Israel wasn't necessarily focused on the physical things or the material things, but at the heart of God's restoration of Israel was his reestablishment of them as his people. In other words, the restoration really wasn't about the land or the real estate, but it was about restored relationship with God. And there's really no other story or no, no other illustration that captures what Israelite, the Israelites' restoration was like other than Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. Now, as many of us know, the story goes, there is a father who has an older son and a younger son. And one day, the younger son comes up to the father, and he demands his inheritance early, before the father dies. And so the father gives it to him. The younger son, he then goes out, and he wastes all his inheritance. He wastes all his money that his father gave him on reckless living. And he, end up, he ends up living and eating with pigs in the pig pen. And eventually, the younger son, he gets so desperate that he eventually tries to go back to his father's house. He decides to try and return back to his father's home. And as he's approaching the house, the father sees him from a distance. He sees his younger son coming back to him, returning to his house, and the father runs to him. He runs to his son, and he embraces him in his arms. And his son looks at his father, and he says, Father, I've sinned against you. I'm not worthy to be called your child, your son anymore. But what the father does then is he embraces his son, and he restores him. The father takes the best robe that he has in the house. He places a ring on the son's hand, and he throws a big feast for him. And the story ends with both the father and the son celebrating together. Now, in this story, for this son, at the end of the parable, what this younger son was celebrating wasn't necessarily the fact that he got to return to his father's inheritance, that he got to return to the safety and the comfort and the security of his father's house, but what the son was celebrating most of all was the fact that despite all his rebellion against his father, that his father welcomed his back into his home as a son that his father had restored their relationship together. And brothers and sisters, in the same way, in verses 1 through 3 in this passage, in Psalm 126, that is what Israel is remembering. They're not necessarily remembering how the Lord gave them so much prosperity materially and physically and gave, their, gave them their inheritance back, but what Israel is remembering and rejoicing in is how God welcomed them back after all their sin and their rebellion against him. And this act of restoration was so great and it was so wonderful that in verse 1, the Israelites say, when God restored us, it was as if it was a dream. It was almost too good to be true. And it filled them with such joy and such excitement that in verse 2, they say that they broke out with laughter and with shouts of joy. They were so overwhelmed with joy to God that they couldn't contain their excitement. And it was to the point where even the people and the nations around them were noticing. Now, as I said before, in Psalm 126, at the time this psalm was written, Israel was currently facing some sort of difficulty, some sort of distress, and it was bringing them to the point of sorrow and weeping and tears. But if you notice, 
This is the very first thing that the Israelites do when they're faced with hardship, when they're faced with suffering and with tears. The very first thing they do is they look back and they remember God's faithfulness to them in the past. They remind themselves of how God restored them before, and that gives them the confidence to face the present and face whatever it is that's causing their tears in the present right now. And that is the first way that Psalm 126 tells us we ought to respond to our tears and to our suffering that we experience in life. And when we're faced with hardship and depression and with sorrow, Psalm 126 teaches us that we need to remember God's faithfulness in the past in order to help us face the present and in order to navigate the tears and the sorrows that we experience in this life right now. Now, obviously, none of us here have experienced exactly what the Israelites experienced in this passage. None of us have experienced being exiled and restored back to the promised land like the Israelites. But in many ways, a lot of us have moments in our lives that we can look back to and we can remember you know, God's faithfulness in restoring us to himself. You know, perhaps as a Christian, you've gone through times in your life or you've gone through a season in your life where you've been slowly backsliding or slowly drifting away from the Lord. Or maybe you've been struggling for so long with a particular sin and you've been stuck in this repetitive cycle of sin and guilt. But time and time again, the Lord restored you. The Lord forgave you. And he showered you with grace and he welcomed you back with open arms. And according to Psalm 126, brothers and sisters, those are moments that we can look back to as believers, that we can remember in times of difficulty, in times of suffering. Those are moments that we can look back to, to remind us of God's faithfulness to us and give us confidence in him to face whatever it is that we're facing in the present. Now, for many of us, brothers and sisters, this is actually very difficult because it doesn't come naturally to us. You know, for most people, when tears come and when sorrows come, most of us will instinctively will lean towards one of two extremes. When we're faced with tears and sufferings, many of us will either will try and just entirely, completely forget the past, or for many of us, we'll do the exact opposite and we'll actually try and live in the past. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, for the first group of people, for those who forget, for these people, when you're faced with suffering and when you're going through difficult times, the very first thing you do is you forget. Now, you lose perspective. You forget how, God good, how good God has been to you in the past, and you lose sight of everything that God has done for you to the point where it's irrelevant to you. Everything that God has done for you in creating you, in giving you life, in providing for you, in giving you salvation in the gospel, you forget all that when you're faced with suffering, and all you can see and all you can remember is your problems, is your suffering, is the thing that's causing you distress and bringing you tears in the current moment. Everything God has done for you in your life, all his goodness, to you it's gone. You can't see it anymore. Now for those of you who have kids or if you've been around uh, little or young kids long enough, you've probably experienced this some form or witnessed this in some form firsthand. You know, maybe you're a parent or you're an older sibling and you, know, you decide to do something nice for your child, you decide to do something nice for your kid sibling. Uh, maybe you take them to Disneyland or you take them to their favorite restaurant. Uh, you take time out of your busy schedule just to play with them and hang out with them. And all of a sudden, something goes wrong. You know, their favorite ride at Disneyland is broken or their ice cream falls off the cone, it falls on the ground, they start getting upset, or their favorite toy that they're playing with at the time, it breaks. All of a sudden, they start complaining, they start crying to you, and in that moment, it doesn't matter how much money you spent on the admission ticket, it doesn't matter how expensive the meal was that you bought for them, it doesn't matter how many hours and how much energy you just spent playing with them and investing time in them, it doesn't matter to them anymore because all that they can see in that moment is their suffering. All they can see is the problem that's in front of them to the point where nothing you've done for them in the past, however recently, nothing matters anymore and nothing is relevant to them. Now, this is an, obviously an exaggerated example, but in many ways, brothers and sisters, oftentimes that's how we are with God, isn't it? If something happens in life, something hits us to the core of our lives, Something shakes us up, and all of a sudden, everything that God has done for us in the past, we forget about it. We lose sight of it. It's almost as, it almost seems as if everything that God has done for us, it doesn't matter anymore, and so we forget and we lose sight of the past because all we can see in that time is our present darkness and our present distress. 
That's one tendency that many of us may lean towards. Now, on the other hand, some of us here, when we're faced with tears, we swing to the opposite end of the spectrum, and instead of forgetting the past, many of us, when we're faced with suffering, will actually try and look back and live in the past. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, these people, these are the types of people where maybe you've been suffering in a very deep and a very personal way recently, or for a long time. You know, you've been dealing with so much conflict, conflict and stress and grief in your life, and because of all that, all you do is think back to the past, all you do is think to how good things were before, that you don't really live in the present. Because your mind, your thoughts, your heart, everything is focused just on good memories and good things that you've experienced in the past. You know, it could be a previous relationship that you were in. Perhaps it was an earlier or happier point in your marriage. Or maybe it was a different point in your life stage or your career. It can even be a time when you as a Christian just felt more alive, more vibrant, more passionate, more on fire for God, whatever it is, your tendency, if you're this type, is when you're faced with tears and when you're faced with suffering, your tendency is to go to the past. But see, instead of allowing those memories of God's faithfulness in the past to propel you and push you into the present, what you do is you're stuck wishing that you could just relive the past, just go back to it. You know, if only things could go back to the way they were, if only I could go back and relive that one part of my past that I cherished and treasured so much, then I'd be happy. But see, brothers and sisters, the danger here is, if you're always stuck in the past, you will never be able to address and face the things that are causing your tears in the present. See, Psalm 126 doesn't allow for that. Because on one hand, although reflecting on and remembering the past is a good thing, if you get so caught up in good things in the past that you never let what God has done for you serve as a foundation and as an anchor for the present, then you will find yourself always never fully living now, but always just being stuck reminiscing, thinking about the past. But see, if you allow the past to push you to God, to remember his faithfulness to you, then and only then will you be actually be able to face the things that are causing you distress in the present. Not because the past takes away the pain in the present, but because the past gives you confidence and the hope in God to face your circumstances and to face the pain and the hardship to remember that the same God who is faithful to you in the past is the same God who's walking with you right now, even in the midst of the things that are causing you tears and causing you heartache. And that is the first response to our tears that Psalm 126 shows us and tells us to do, that when we're faced with tears and suffering, we're to remember what God has done for us and to find confidence in that. And this brings us to our second point. You know, just reading this psalm, uh, you might wonder why the Israelites, the psalm is broken up into two halves, verses 1 through 3 and 4 through 6. In the psalm, you might wonder why the Israelites, in verse 4, they cry out to God, restore our fortunes, when in verse 1, they have already looked back and they've already, already remembered when, the, when God restored the fortunes of Zion. Now, the reason that is is because when the Israelites returned to the promised land after the exile, it wasn't a perf return to perfect paradise. See, although they said in verse 1, initially, it was like a dream, when they actually returned, it wasn't everything they expected, and it wasn't their dream come true. See, when they returned, there were social tensions between the returning tribes and the local people. When they returned, there was drought, there was famine that they had to deal with. And on top of all that, the second temple hadn't even been built yet. And so the Israelites, they couldn't even worship God, and they couldn't even have fellowship with him properly. And so although God had already restored Israel, the restoration wasn't yet complete. And so Israel had to live, when they came back to the promised land, they had to live within this already and this not yet tension. See, on the one hand, God had already brought them back to the promised land. He restored them as his people, but that didn't mean that they stopped experiencing grief and they stopped experiencing suffering. In the same way, brothers and sisters, we as Christians also live within that same tension, just like the Israelites. And we've been redeemed by God. We've been restored to him in Christ, and we've been made citizens of heaven, but yet on a regular basis, we're faced and we still have to deal with and experience tears in this life, whether it's in our own lives or the people around us. And brothers and sisters, on a purely human level, what do your tears represent? You know, when you're grieving or when you're distressed, what are your tears really saying? What they're saying is, this isn't the way things are supposed to be. This isn't right. 
See, our tears are signs that we're still very much broken and sinful people who live in a broken and sinful world. That although God has promised us in Revelation 21 that one day he will come again and he'll take away every tear and there'll be no more mourning or crying or sadness, our tears right now are signs that that day is still yet to come, that it hasn't arrived yet. And as a Christian living on this side of glory, as difficult as this is, this is the reality that you and I have to face and live with each day. And that in some ways, our lives right now will always be characterized by what verse 4 of Psalm, 4, of Psalm 126 says. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Now, what is this verse saying? The Negev was a dry, it was a desert, arid area where there was always drought and it was always barren in the summertime. But a few times every winter, rain would come and overnight it would transform this dry desert area into a lush river. And see, what the Israelites are saying here in verse 4 is that, God, our lives right now, they're like a desert. Lord, we're suffering. Lord, we're weeping. Come restore us. And brothers and sisters, in many ways, that is the experience of the Christian life. You know, right now, our lives, through this life, through this pilgrimage on this earth, are like a desert. And many of us may come here this morning feeling like, our lives are like deserts. You know, there's no vibrancy. We feel spiritually dry or empty. Our lives are filled with tears because of the harsh realities of life. And what we need more than anything else is for God to come and restore us, to restore our joy in him. And what's so important, brothers and sisters, that Psalm 126 shows us here is that for Christians, the path to joy and the path to restoration that God sets before us actually comes through our suffering, and comes through our tears. That the way God brings about restoration to our lives is actually through those desert experiences that we experience and through our tears. And so how does God do this? Well, he does so through teaching us how to sow our tears. Now, if you look with me at verses 5 and 6, these are some of the most comforting words in the entire Psalter. And they say, Those who sow tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Now, what these verses teach us here is that how to reap joy, how we reap joy in the midst of sorrow, it depends on what we do with our tears. How we reap joy depends on how we handle our tears. See, for non-Christians, they basically have, there's basically two ways you can handle and deal with your fears. You can either suppress them or you can vent them. You can either be just uncomfortable and uncautious about your feelings to the point where you dismiss them altogether, or you can trust and you can follow your feelings in your heart so much that you basically let your feelings and your emotions dictate everything that you believe and everything that you do in life. But see, what Psalm 126 says is that the way to reap true joy, even in the midst of hardship and suffering, isn't through rejecting or venting your tears, but it's actually the way that you sow your, te your tears is through prayer, is through honestly expressing your emotions and bringing them before your Heavenly Father. Now, as I said before, Psalm 126 is categorized as a psalm of lament. And one of the most unique characteristics of psalms of lament is that they contain some of the most unbiblical and emotionally charged language and statements in the entire Bible. Now, for example, in the opening of Psalm 10, the psalmist in Psalm 10, he writes, why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why, O Lord, do you hide your face in times of trouble? Or in Psalm 13, verse 1, David opens and begins this psalm that he writes with this statement, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Now, in both of these psalms here, has God really abandoned the Christian? Now, has God really hidden himself from and forgotten about them? No. But see, the point here is they feel forgotten. They feel abandoned. And more importantly than that, they're open enough with God to bring it before him. They're not afraid to express their grief and express the emotions that they're actually feeling against God, towards God, to God. Now, some of you may be thinking at this point, okay, well, if that's the case, then what's the difference between just venting and dumping all my emotions at God and yelling at him and getting angry at him? What's the difference between that and actually praying your emotions, praying your tears. 
And the answer is this. See, most commentators will note that although almost every psalm of lament, you know, it ends not actually in despair, even though there's lament and crying throughout the entire psalm, but most commentators will note that almost every psalm of lament ends actually not in despair, but it ends in confidence in God. In other words, psalms of lament, although they're filled with so much raw and real emotion towards and against God, what they end in is not, they don't start and just end with emotion, but they end with truth. See, the psalmist, despite how he may feel towards God, he ends the psalm by reminding himself of who God is and placing his confidence in God. And brothers and sisters, that is what it means to sow your tears in prayer. It's not by suppressing and hiding your emotions from God, but at the same time, it's not through letting your emotions just control your life and dictate your relationship with God, but the way that you actually sow your tears is through being completely transparent and honest with God in your prayers. And through, and through coming before him and placing your emotions at his feet, but at the same time placing your confidence in the God who comforts you and in the God who can turn your sorrows into joy. And friends, do you want to know why you can come before God honestly with your tears and with your emotions? Brothers and sisters, do you want to know why it's okay for you to come before God with your grief with your frustrations, with your sorrow, with your sadness, to express all of that and not have to worry that God's going to ignore you, that he's not going to listen to you, not have to worry that he's going to reject you because of the emotions you're expressing against him. Well, it's because our God understands, brothers and sisters. He understands our suffering. Because at the right time, he himself came down into this world and he suffered and he cried alongside us. He became a man of sorrows who is acquainted with grief. And not only did he suffer alongside us, but he suffered for us. Our Savior Jesus came into this world to suffer for us upon the cross. And as Jesus was dying upon the cross, and as he cried out and poured his heart and all his emotions out to the Father, honestly, my God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? He received no response. And he was ignored by God. He received no reply to his tears and his cries. He was the one who God truly hid his face from and abandoned and rejected. And why? Well, brothers and sisters, it's so that you and I, even in those moments when we're, our lives are filled with tears, and we're filled with so much deep sorrow and emotion, in those times when we feel like God has abandoned us and forgotten us, in those moments we can know with confidence that we aren't that we can know with confidence that our God will never forsake us, he'll never abandon us, and that although we may be sowing in tears right now, that one day our Lord will take all those tears and turn them into joy. And so as we close, brothers and sisters, now whether you're going through a period of suffering and difficulty in your life right now, when the tears actually come and when the pain comes, brothers and sisters, don't forget don't forget, remember how good and how faithful God has been to you in your life. In all those moments where he's restored you time and time again to him by his grace and by his mercy. And come before him. Come before him honestly with all your brokenness, with all your emotions, all your tears, knowing and trusting that those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. As our Savior Jesus promises us himself in John 16 verse 22. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your faithfulness to us, Lord. So often in our lives, when we're faced with difficulty, when we're faced with or the deep emotions and the tears that we have to experience in this life, Lord, oftentimes, Lord, we confess that we become so disoriented and we're so prone to forgetting Lord, how good you have been to us in our lives. We're so prone to taking your grace for granted, Lord. But we pray that even in the midst of all our sorrows and all our tears and suffering that we face in this life, Lord, that you'd help us to have confidence in our Savior Jesus to come before you, Lord, and to honestly express the emotions that we feel. But above all those things, Lord, to, your, to be reminded of your goodness to us in the gospel and who you are, Lord.
And so would you, for those of us who are going through period, a period of grief right now in our lives, Lord, would you comfort us? And would you help us have confidence knowing that one day, Lord, you will come again and that you'll wipe away every tear and that there will be no more mourning or crying or sadness, Lord, because you will be our God and we will be your people. So we thank you so much for your grace and your goodness to us.